All right, uh, so today what I wanted to do is introduce you all to um, a couple different classes that our forestry majors end up taking as part of their curriculum. So they'll take a sophomore level course called Forest Biometrics, and then they'll take timber cruising at Field Station for all majors. And between those two courses, they really learn how to go out into a forest and how to measure that forest. And it could be for a variety of different objectives, uh, but one very common objective we have is for timber management. So simply to learn how much timber you actually have out there, predict that, and then you'll be able to use that if you're buying the stand to harvest, if you're buying the stand because you work for a mill, um, or if you're a consulting forester and you're working with a landowner and that landowner wants to sell their timber, you can get a pretty good prediction of how much timber is out there. And so as we look at this, I want to talk a little bit about measurement needs. Um, and then what we're going to do is go through a few different scales of measurement. So I'm going to start by telling you how do you measure just one tree, then we'll move on to how you measure a whole group of trees, which is a stand, uh, or a stand. Then we'll talk about different sampling designs, which are going to include plot sampling, point sampling, and transect sampling. Uh, so just a quick show of hands, how many people have already had a statistics course in either high school, college? So it looks like about half of you. So biometrics functions, uh, a lot of what we're gonna do here uh, upon a foundation of statistics. So if you wanna be good at forest biometrics, you need to have a good understanding um, of statistics, at least at that introductory level, where you look at population means, population variance, and how to estimate different parameters within a population. And so let's start with what we wanna know. And so when you look at what we wanna know within a forest, we can look at a lot of different variables. So if you want to assess a forest ecologically, sometimes simply whether certain species are there or not, the presence or absence of species is going to be really important. And so presence, absence can play a role. Um, that gets at the ideas of species richness and of composition. And so species richness is simply the total number of species you have in an area. And so uh, you all will be getting into wetland delineation, for example. And so identifying all the different species, plant species and herbaceous species you have out in that area will help you define whether it's a wetland or not. And so what you're actually looking at there is the composition of that area. And so composition can be your tree species or your other species. Even if we're just managing for timber, composition is important. Because different species of trees grow differently from each other, they have different ecology, and they make different products. So they may go to different mills and be harvested for different reasons. So composition is important. Abundance is also going to be important, and that abundance we can express as a density. So how many trees are within a certain area of land? And then we can start getting more technical with that. Uh, how many cubic feet per acre do we have? How many tons per acre of saw timber do we have? which is our large trees that you can saw into two by fours. So we call them saw timber. So abundance is one we spend a lot of time focused on when we're looking at timber, but it's important for other objectives as well. And then there's lots of other different ways that we can assess the structure of a forest, okay? So the forests out in California, Oregon, and Washington State have been all over the news lately, why? Yeah, there's a lot of fires out there. And so to have a fire in a forest, you need fuels. And so we can use a lot of these techniques to assess, you know, how many standing live trees are out there, how many standing dead trees are out there, and what's the volume of down dead trees. And when you think about a fire in a forest, it's not just the trees themselves that burns. The litter layer, the downed decomposing leaves off the trees or needles in a conifer, that, that can burn as well, so you assess the litter layer, you assess all the other vegetation, and so that's gonna be really, really important as we're seeing in the news today. Um, we have forests that our college owns that we're managing for carbon, and so we have about 3,000 acres of forests that were uh, given to our college uh, by a European company, and they get the carbon credits off it, but we're able to manage the timber off of it, and we can use that timber to pay for scholarships for many of you. And so we see carbon management even here in deep east Texas, where we don't have any regulatory markets right here for carbon at this time point. So there's lots of other structural aspects of a forest that we may be interested in quantifying. Okay, so with forestry, 
we use a bunch of clunky old English units. Um, so it'd be really convenient if everything was in metric, uh, but because we've been doing this for a long time and because we're working with loggers and with mills and with foresters and all these different diverse groups, we still use these English units. So we got to understand them a little bit. And so you guys have probably never used the unit of a chain to measure distance or may have never even heard of it, but a chain is 66 feet long. And they call it a chain because they used to actually have chains that were that length. And these chains would have 100 links in them. So a link was defined as 66 divided by 100. That would be the length of a link. Um, and that's, that's where we came up with, you may have wondered why the heck is a mile 5,280 feet? That seems totally arbitrary. Well, a mile is 80 chains long, okay? So it came from the unit of a chain. An acre of land is 10 square chains. So if you have an area that's 66 by 66 feet and you have 10 of those, that's gonna be an acre. So it's gonna be exactly 4,300, uh, 43,560 square feet. And then if we have a square mile, it's gonna have 640 acres in it because we've you know, defined all this from the unit of the chain. So when you look at the survey system for parts of West Texas and parts further West, you'll see everything is set up as a township which is a six mile by six mile area. Each mile, square mile is gonna be 640 acres. So if you divide that in a quarter, it's 160 acres. And if you divide that in a quarter, it's 40 acres. So when you hear about US policy, you know, post civil war, 40 acres and a mule, that's where 40 acres came from. It came from easy divisions of all these units. Uh, so these units may be unfamiliar to you, but they really played a big role in our history here. We use some other kind of cumbersome units. Uh, we'll use a board foot. And so if your desks here were actually made of solid wood, which they're not, um, and if they were exactly an inch thick, which they probably aren't, and you took a 12 inch by 12 inch area out of it, that would be one board foot. So it's a board that's 12 inches by 12 inch by one inch thick. And so that makes it 144 cubic inches. 12 of these will make one cubic foot of wood. We'll use this for high quality saw cut. For firewood or pulpwood, uh, we use units called cords, where a cord is a big pile of firewood, so it's counting the airspace between them. They're stacked, but you know it's not a solid block of wood. But it's four foot by four foot by eight feet, um, and so you can see that's going to be 16 times eight, so that's actually 128 square feet of stacked firewood would be a cord. Um, a face cord is half a cord, so there you go. And then there, there's other units here. If you've ever heard of a furlong, you know, follow racing or something like that. A furlong is 10 chains, so that's 660 feet. Um, and then the other units you can see there. So, so there's a little background on some of the units we'll be looking at. And so now let's talk about individual tree measurements and how we record all this data that we can collect. And so when we measure an individual tree, we commonly look at the diameter, the height, we can also look at the age, and then we can look at the size or weight of that tree. And then once we get to the entire forest, we again can look at how many trees there are on an acre. Basal area is kind of a cumbersome concept, but it's very useful in forestry. I'll explain that in a moment. And then we can get to ideas about the ecology of the stand in terms of either, you know, the quality of the site, that site index, or is it close to carrying capacity? Are we growing as many trees per acre at a given size that will fit out there? And that's stocking. So I'll get into those at more. So let's start with measuring one tree, okay? Trees are approximately cylinders, right? Uh, but the shape gets real complicated around that. And so we'll go out and we'll measure diameter. And for diameter, we use what we call diameter at breast height, DBH. So that's four and a half feet. Um, and it's basically because we don't wanna hurt our backs. We don't wanna bend over a hundred times a day and measure trees down at the ground level. We wanna measure them where it's convenient to measure. So we measure them all four and a half feet off the ground and you can wrap a tape measure around them and we have special diameter tapes where instead of saying one inch, two inch, three inch, it's got that one, two and three multiplied by pi. So remember the formula for the diameter is circumference divided by pi. So when we wrap these tapes around, if this says 12.2, that tree is 12.2 inches in diameter. So it just goes ahead and does the math for you. Um, we've got calipers. Calipers are pretty handy, and these are pretty large calipers. They're handy in this part of the world because if you have a tape, you've got to move vines off the tree. 
But if you have calipers, then you can stick them under the vines or you can find a spot on the tree where there are vines. And some of our vines are species like poison ivy. So you may not want to touch them if you can avoid it. So calipers are going to be pretty good. There's all sorts of different rules for how you measure the diameter of a tree, depending on whether there's something wrong with the tree in four and a half feet. You know, it has a salt swollen spot there, a burl or something like that. Depending on whether it forks. If it forks below four and a half feet, you treat it as two trees. If it forks above there, you treat it as one tree. And then what do you do with hills? And the most common thing we do with hills is go to the uphill side of the tree. And that's where you go four and a half feet up to measure that tree. And we've decided on all these practically because why are we measuring diameters? We want to know how big the tree is. And if we want to know how big the tree is, often it's for timber. And that means someone's going to be coming and cutting these trees down. And we want our estimate of volume to be good. And so that's why we go uphill because that's how logging works. That's why you may avoid features like this because the logging equipment will probably jump up this. They'll go up above it and they'll cut it right there. And then, then that's why you handle forks the way you do. Um, because a tree that forks near the ground, you know, you're going to cut that down as basically two trees. And so that's why we treat them. Next up, we need to estimate height. Okay. We almost never measure height. Because to measure height, you would need to climb a tree and drop a tape measure down. And that would be measuring height. And we don't want to climb a bunch of 100 foot tall trees. When you see uh, stuff on TV about people studying the tallest trees in the world, the 379 foot coastal redwoods out in California, they do measure the height of those trees. So they'll cr climb 350 plus foot tall trees with all sorts of fancy equipment, um, a mix of rock climbing and arboricultural equipment, and they will drop a tape measure down them and they'll measure. Okay? But for almost everything we do operationally, we want to stay on the ground. So we estima estimate tree height, and we do that with stuff that you all have had in basic geometry using some pretty simple trigonometry, okay? And so we have equipment, uh, you may use what we call a clinometer, and all a clinometer is is it's a wheel level. So it's this wheel that you hold in something that looks like a compass, and whatever angle you hold that thing at, the wheel stays level. And so you can look up and you can figure out the angle up, you can look down, you can figure out the angle down, and you've measured how far away you are from the tree. And so you have two triangles. You know this angle, you know this distance. So you can use trigonometry to figure out that height. You can use trigonometry to figure out that height. Well, when we're out in the woods, we don't want to keep, you know, getting out a fancy calculator and doing a bunch of trigonometry when it's raining and we're getting eaten by mosquitoes. So we have these clinometers with scales where we've already done a lot of the tricks. So you can go and do it on a percent scale where the math is real easy. Or, you know, if you go exactly 66 feet away, you know, it'll just give you the actual height of the tree when you look through that device. And then, of course, that's the old school optical equipment. Nowadays, we'll have electronic equipment that will work with lasers or acoustics. And so you just, you know, click a button here, click a button here, click a button here, and then you look at it and the readout tells you exactly how tall that tree is. But this is what that equipment's doing. It's just measuring or estimating distances and angles. That's all it's doing. Um, you can go do this yourself very easily with very little equipment. Um, all you would need is a ruler or a yardstick or a stick where you know the length of it. And you can go out and you can find a spot where when you hold it at your arm's length, the tree looks the same height as the stick. And then you can measure the distance from your eye to where the stick is. You can measure from where you are to where the tree is. And you can use some simple trigonometry to figure out how tall that tree is based on that ratio of distance. So. You know, this stuff is pretty basic math, uh, but we've just tried to make it more efficient operationally. Okay, we can measure tree age, okay? Um, and the easiest way to estimate a tree's age is actually with a piece of equipment called a chainsaw. So cut the tree down, count the rings, you know how old it was. The problem is you don't know how old it is because you cut it down, right? Um, there was a graduate student, uh, again, I keep using a bunch of California examples today for some reason, but there was a graduate student over in California that was researching one of our oldest tree species, crystal cone pine, on some Forest Service property. And they were trying to estimate age, they were having trouble doing it, and they got permission from the Forest Service to cut the tree down to count the rings. They counted the rings, realized that tree was over 5,000 years and had been the oldest living organism we were aware of. So, oops. Um, but this is the equipment they were trying to use. Um, this is an increment borer. 
And so basically, it's just a hollow drill bit. And so here we have it not hooked up to a drill, but just a handle. So you're turning the drill bit yourself manually. And you get it in the middle of the tree. You pull the core that looks like sort of a soda straw out of the tree. And you can count the rings on that. And this would be like you or I getting a little minor skin biopsy. The tree's going to be fine. Um, this is very little tissue to remove from it. It's going to heal up no problem. And so that allows you to sample ages on living trees without doing too much harm to them. That being said, you know, if this is going to be a really valuable species like black walnut or cherry bark oak, you may not want to do that because you would be putting holes into, you know, boards that will eventually be cut out of there. So um, with those rings, we can do all sorts of cool stuff. They've used them to, you know, estimate past climates. Um, they've used tree rings to figure out, you know, that 300 years ago, a bunch of trees in the Pacific Northwest died, and then they linked that up with tsunami records that Japan has been keeping for centuries and figured out there was some major earthquakes. So they've used tree rings to figure out past disturbances. They've used them to figure out past climates. Um, they've gone and they've looked at wood in cabins and, you know, measured the ring widths, correlated those to living and dead trees they found out there and figured out when they built the cabin. So lots of different historical things you can do with tree rings, and they call that field dendrochronology, basically studying time of tree rings. Okay, so we've got the diameter, we've got the height. If a tree was a cylinder, it'd be super easy, right? Half the diameter is the radius, radius squared times pi, that's the area of a circle, times height, that's the volume of a cylinder, we would be done, easy. Even if it was a cone, it would be real easy. Pi r squared times a third is the volume of a cone, okay? But trees are these weird combination of shapes. Um, here it's showing an example of a tree where they're modeling it as a neoloid down low. You don't have to worry if you don't know those terms, but a paraboloid and a conoid. So just different shapes somewhere between a cylinder and a cone. And because of that, estimating the volume of one diameter measurement, and one height measurement becomes difficult. So what we do is we model this out. We may have done research studies where we actually went out, cut trees down and weighed them to see how much they weighed. And so you'll be able to look up on a volume table that you can find in the literature, where here, if my tree is 20 inches in diameter and it's two 16 foot saw logs tall, so 32 feet of virtual timber, that weighs 1.94 tons. So that tree is almost two tons. So uh, we can look them up on volume tables or there will be equations where you'll plug in diameter and height and it'll give you an estimate of the volume. And so we usually estimate these based on research that's been published. Okay, so any questions on measuring individual trees? That's everything on measuring individual trees. And, and again, if it feels like I'm going kind of fast, this is basically a whole semester's course I'm just giving you the highlights of in one 50 minute lecture, so. Um, next up, we need to look at whole stand data. So we combine all those individual tree measurements, we put them on an area basis, and we start putting in plots, and we start sampling to figure out what we have at the whole stand. So trees per acre is pretty straightforward. If you know you have one acre of land and there's 10 trees on it, you have 10 trees per acre, okay? It's gonna be easy to estimate in plots too, because if you go out there and you put in a plot that's a 10th of an acre, and you put in 10 plots, they're all a 10th of an acre, or you put in 20 plots, they're all a 10th of an acre, and you average five trees on each of those plots, well, that means that represents a 10th of an acre, so that means there's 50 trees on an acre. And so getting to trees per acre is pretty straightforward, pretty easy math. The next concept I wanna show you is basal area, okay? And so here's the best way to explain basal area. Say we have a forest and it's an acre of land. We know it's one acre. We go out there with a chainsaw and we cut every tree down at DBH completely flat. And so what we're left with is an acre of stumps. All those stumps are four and a half feet tall and all these trees have perfect circles on top, okay? Well, what we do then is we go out and we figure out what's the cross-sectional area of this stump, this stump, this stump, this stump, this stump, and we add them together over our whole acre of land and that is our basal area, okay? And so we'll typically express it in units of square feet of cross-sectional area of the trees per acre. So the units are square feet per acre. And so typical units on this may be 100 square feet per acre. 150 square feet per acre would be a stand with a lot of trees in it. And that sounds kind of arcane, but here's why it's important. 
basal area correlates pretty darn well to volume. And you can see how easy this is going to be to estimate. If I go out in a 10th acre plot and I get diameters on the trees, I can come back in here, I can type it into a spreadsheet. And if I know I had seven trees on my 10th acre plot, I would know I have seven trees, 70 trees per acre, right? But then what I could do from those diameters of the trees that I had measured, I could take the radius, I could square it, I could multiply it by pi, I could convert it to square feet, add them up, and if I had six square feet in that 10th acre plot, I would know I had 60 square feet per acre of basal edge. I would scale it up to a whole acre. And so that's how I would get the basal area, the simplest way you can get basal edge. And so because we can wrap the D-tape around the tree or use those calipers, or even people get really good at just looking at a tree and eyeballing how big it is, once you've seen enough of these, you get a pretty good eye for it, you can go in and you don't have to cut the trees down or anything like that, so you can estimate basal area as the trees are still standing. Now if normal, yeah, there's a question. Okay, so just to clarify from my understanding, basal area is the amount of area taken up by the trees? By the cross sections of their stem, four and a half feet off the ground, yeah. And so if you think about the typical range, you might find between 50 and 150 square feet per acre. Well, remember, an acre was 43,560 square feet. That means of those 43,560 square feet, only about 100 of those square feet are actually occupied by the trunk of a stem. So trees at ground level don't take up much area at all. Yeah. Um, so I'll go over some other ways you can estimate this that are pretty neat, but much more difficult to understand. Um, I got this equation up there for you. So you guys all know the geometry and environmental science. You guys are always real good at math. But diameter divided by 2 equals radius. We need to square that, you know, in that area equation for a circle. So when you square d over 2, the 2 becomes a 4, okay? So we have a 4 in the denominator. We have pi, 3.1415265. And then we have 144 in this equation as well, because all that's being done in inches. That's giving you an area in square inches. But we know there's 12 by 12 inches in a square foot, so 144 square inches in one foot. So when you work out all those unit conversions, you can boil all those numbers down to this 0 0.005454. And so if you take the diameter of, of you know, any circle, you square it, you multiply it by that, that's taking the diameter in inches and giving you the area in square feet, which is what that equation does. So foresters usually memorize this because then we don't have to worry about doing that math every time. It's so that's a little bit on basal area. Okay, let me show you one area where these are useful. If you can go and measure trees per acre of basal area on that 10th acre plot or 20th acre plot or whatever size plot makes sense, we can go to the literature and we can find diagrams like this. And I know that looks real complicated. Um, a guy named Gingrich came up with these in 1968 in Indiana. Um, and when you look at this stocking guide, it tells you how to think about managing that forest. Okay? And so I can look on my y-axis here, and I can see that's basal area. We just talked about that. I can look on my x-axis here. That's trees per acre. We just talked about that. So I could very easily plot a point on this diagram. So if I had 150 trees per acre and my basal area was 120 square feet per acre, I would be right there. Okay? Well, once you know the basal area and once you know the trees per acre, there's a mathematical relationship between those two in diameter, right? And so we know that if you have 120 square feet per acre and 150 trees per acre, your average diameter, it's right between this line 14 and this line 11, your average diameter there is gonna be about 12 to 13 inches. So you can already be getting a mental image. You're already out in this forest, hopefully you saw it, but you can check it here and say, yeah, my average tree size was about 12 to 13 inches in diameter. Those were the data I collected. And so you've got diameter lines going out this way, radiating out from zero, zero, okay? Uh, but that's not the real useful thing here. The real useful thing is these lines going this way, sweeping from top left to bottom right. Those are stocking lines. And what stocking is, is how many trees do we have out there relative to how many trees we think we can have out there. And how many trees we think we can have out there is based on experts uh, quantifying their forests. And so if you have too many trees per acre at a certain size, of course, we can fit fewer big trees and more little trees per acre. 
But if you have too many trees per acre out there for the size of those trees, what's going to happen to some of them? They're going to die. They're going to outcompete the other ones. Okay? And so in a forest, you may want that to happen. You may have a wildlife species you're managing habitat for, and that wildlife species needs dead trees. And so you want those dead trees there. But if you're managing your forest and you don't want fuel loading to be a problem, you want to mitigate your wildfire risks, those dead trees are a problem. And if you're managing your forest and the landowner wants to make money by harvesting their timber, well, if you had cut those dead trees before they died, they might have gone to a mill and made a product the landowner might have made some money on. So you missed an opportunity to thin your stand where the logger comes out and cuts down some, but not all of the trees. So you continue growing the forest and you take some trees to different mills where they can make products. This diagram tells you, if I'm right here in that example we've been using, okay, I'm above this 100% stocking line, that's a stand where if you don't have mortality in there now, it's going to happen very, very soon, okay? That stand is above this 100% line, and you can kind of think of that 100% line as carrying capacity. We've hit or slightly exceeded carrying capacity for this site, which means if we leave it alone, things are gonna start dying. You're gonna start losing the weaker trees, the trees that are in inferior crown positions, they're under the other trees, and so you're gonna have that mortality. So it's both telling you, hey, you may have a problem, and it's also an opportunity. So we may be able to go out and thin that stand and prevent this from happening. Well, then the question is, how much do you thin the stand? How many trees do you cut down per acre? What basal area do you cut the stand down to? This diagram helps with that too. See this dotted line at a different angle here called the B line? What we know from some measurements is that if you manage your forest below that, you're wasting growing space, okay? If you have only, you know, 75 trees per acre out there that are 70 square feet per acre, we'd be right about here on this diagram. That means your trees aren't using all the nutrients on that site, your trees aren't using all the water on that site, your trees aren't capturing all the light on that site. You could fit more trees of those size per acre. So you're wasting growing space. That may not be a problem. If you have a wildlife species that wants that structure and that's what the landowner wants, there's no reason you can't manage your forest that way. But if the landowner wants timber and they want to keep producing as much timber as they can, you don't want to be managing a stand below this bee line because you'd be wasting growing space. So now it tells me how much I should thin my stand. So if I'm up, feet, up right up here, I can thin it down to right about here. I'm not wasting growing space. And now my stand can keep growing all the way up to that line again before I have to thin it again. So if you just go basal area and trees per acre, you can figure out a whole lot about how to manage your forest, okay? This diagram is for bottomland hardwoods in the south, okay? If we've started looking at pine in the south or other tree species in other regions, we would need different diagrams because you can fit fewer or more trees per acre of different species. It depends on their silvics. If they can tolerate a lot of shade, you can fit more of them per acre. If they tend to have real narrow crowns versus wide branchy crowns, you can fit more of them per acre. So, so that's a little bit on stocking and how you would use these stand level measurements to estimate stocking. Okay, this next concept is called site index. And this gives our forestry students a lot of trouble, but it really is a very simple concept at heart. So one thing you have to know going into this, density does not have a major effect on tree height growth. If I plant 100 trees per acre over here, and then the other half of the stand, I plant 1,000 trees per acre, they're gonna grow at similar height rate. And that's for good reason, because if a tree isn't growing at its maximum height rate, it's likely to be shaded out by another tree in that stand, it gets shaded out and it dies. So natural selection has led to height growth being a very conserved feature. Trees are always gonna grow at the maximum height rate they can. But let's think about it. Where are trees gonna grow faster? Are they gonna grow faster here in East Texas or up in Canada? They're gonna grow faster here. Our growing season is like 11 months long, maybe even 12 months long. Uh, trees are growing if it's above 40 degrees Fahrenheit, right? They may not be growing, but they're photosynthesizing if they have green leaves on them. So our pines, which are evergreen, are photosynthesizing. They're getting sugar that they can use to grow at a different time of year. But if you go up north, it's below 40 degrees Fahrenheit for a long period of the year. And so shorter growing season, slower growth. 
okay? And so that's an example of the climate influencing growth of trees. Now, if I took you out here and you wanted to make money growing trees here in East Texas, and I took you to two spots, and one spot, we dug a soil pit, and that soil pit was pure beach sand, you know, very coarse sand grains, 15 feet deep. And then I took you to another spot, and we dug a soil pit, and it was loamy with a little bit of silt in there, a little bit of clay, a little bit of sand. Which, which site would you want to get a forest growing on? Number two, the loamy site, right? We know that's a soil that's going to hold more water, it's going to hold more nutrients, and so we would anticipate trees or any other plant you wanted to establish on it probably growing at a faster rate. So that's the soil looking at water, nutrients, all those things. Okay, and so the idea with site index is we know climate affects plant growth, we know soils affect plant growth, let's just use the plant to tell us how good a spot that is for a plant to grow. In. And so all we do is we have an index age. And so for stands we plant and grow rapidly in the south, we use 25 years, because that's an average rotation length for a lot of log mine folks. For a stand that we let seed it on its own, so it's naturally regenerated, and we grow it out, the typical rotation length around here may be 50 years. So we use a 50 year index. And then if you go up north throughout the Pacific Northwest, they may have species where you're using a 100 year index. On the roads of pine out west, they're very slow. So estimating it at 100 years is reasonable. And all we want to know is how tall is that tree going to be when it hits that age? Okay? And so we have a lot of curves like this in the literature. And this specific curve is for longleaf pine here in the US South. So if I go out and I use my clinometer and I estimate my tree height in the longleaf stand, and then I take my increment core and I core it and I count the rings so I know the age of my longleaf stand, and I know my longleaf stand is 30 years old and I've estimated my trees at 45 feet tall, I'm right here on this diagram. So I've just looked that up with age on the x-axis, height on the y-axis. Well, I'm right on this curve, so if I look at how this curve is labeled, it says 60. So in my 30-year-old stand, all I'm saying is that by the time those trees are 50 years old, they'll probably be about 60 feet tall, okay? And so what I could do then is I could compare that to another stand of longleaf pine. I could have that stand at a different age, that stand might be a different height, and I might get a different site index. So my site index there might be 90 feet at 50 years old. And what I'd be able to tell you is, hey, this other site is way more productive. The soils are better, the climate's better. Something out there is better for the trees than that first site I estimated at only 60 feet tall at 50 years. So all site index is, is it's height at a given age. And so we're using the trees as phytometers. So a phytometer is just a plant that is quantifying something, estimating something for us. In this case, it's integrating the environment. So what's, what's another factor <clears throat> that influences plant growth beyond this broad category we're calling environment? So what else influences plant growth? Climate. So climate's all part of environment, right? But yeah, climate is a big factor in environment. You are right. In some answers, but I can't quite tell what through all these masks. <laughs> yeah. So our management effects, absolutely. Yeah, so you could have anthropogenic effects. So that's going to be something big. You know, depending on how we manage stands, it can make a difference. But what else? Even if we're not managing them, even if we're hands off. And we've been talking about it a little. We just haven't used these specific terms. So we've been talking about different species, right? So what's the broad category for that sense of variability? Right. Yeah, so you're actually looking at an interaction of this factor and the environment. But what's the factor? Species is one aspect of it, yeah. We could do, not trees, we could do any living organism. Biodiversity is part of it, yeah. So what's the, what's the broad category? So evolution, we're dancing around it, right? What are all those in a textbook for? What class? It's a, it's a subcategory of biology, yeah. So you take a class and they're talking about evolution, 
They're talking about how environments interact with different species. They're talking about biodiversity. That's part of ecology, yeah, but when you get into it, Botany's going to get you into plant morphology, right? Biota? I don't know. Yeah, it's all part of the biota. So think about factors we can control. What did Mendel control with his pea plants? The genetics, right? So we've got this broad category called genetics, right, that all that fits into. And so we can think about genetics maybe naturally varying and impacting how well plants grow. <clears throat> but we can control genetics to some extent ourselves. So as you go around Deep East Texas, who's seen a pine tree around here? Okay, everybody, right? Um, but what you may not have realized, all these pine trees you've been seeing, those aren't just natural pine trees growing out in the woods anymore. We've been breeding them since 1950. Just like, you know, when you drive around here and you see a cow in a pasture, that's not some natural animal. We've been breeding those for thousands of years but we've been breeding our pine trees in the South since the mid 1950s. And so the pine trees you see out here are probably growing straighter, they're growing faster, and they're more resistant to diseases like fusiform rust than it, they would have been if you'd been driving around here in 1950 uh, and looking at pine trees. So, so genetics is a factor here. So we commonly think of site index as just the plants telling us this is what the site can do. The climate's always going to be pretty similar. Of course, it'll change gradually, but the climate there, you can't really impact that. The soils, you can't really impact that. So it's this fixed property of the site. But what we've realized more recently is if we manage, if we use fertilizer, we can fix problems with the soil. If we plant better genetics, we can get better growth rates. If we use herbicides so that all the light, water, and nutrients on that site go to the trees we want them to go to, because we're controlling or killing the other vegetation, what we figured out is we can control site index if we can afford to use expensive treatments to do it. And so we're actually seeing our site indices in our plantations in the South going up. They're, they're increasing. So. so site index is going to be a very important concept and you have to understand a lot of ecology, uh, botany, all these things we've been discussing to really understand it. But all it is is how tall the trees are at a certain year. So it's very easy to understand what it is. Okay, <clears throat> so those were variables we can look at the stand scale. So we've gone over tree scale variables, stand scale variables. Now what I want to do uh, for the, the rest of uh, our few minutes here is look at sampling. How do we go out and sample all this? And I've already given you a bunch of good examples of a fixed area plot. And so we can do fixed area plots where we go out and I've shown you this diagram. That's real easy, I think, for all of us to understand. If I, if I told a group of folks that hadn't had biometrics, go sample the forest, most people would probably start doing fixed area plots. Um, the groups that you know just wanted to be out there for a very long time might try to measure every tree in the forest, right? But that's the downside. You're out there for a very long time. It's not efficient, okay? Um, but I also want to tell you about variable radius points and transects, which are a few other techniques we can use. But however you're going to do these, you probably need some sort of systematic or random sampling. So once you understand statistics a little better, all you're figuring out is what's a way that I can use to sample my population to estimate variables about my population that's not going to bias it. And so if you think your trees are randomly distributed within your stand, you can probably go put in a grid of fixed area plots and that'll be pretty representative of what your forest is. Now if you know you have a stream running right through the middle of your forest right here, you might want to stratify it where you're like these plots are not going to represent the conditions over here in most of my stand that may be pine, but I know in this stream right here, I have a lot of hardwood. So I'm gonna sample this with some plots and treat it as a separate area than the, the rest of it. So you can stratify it if you need to. Okay, we can put in all sorts of different types of plots. We can measure big trees, we can measure small trees. We can measure seedlings. And measuring seedlings can be used for all sorts of different things. If we're trying to predict how to grow the next forest, knowing what seedlings are there may be helpful. And there may be all sorts of regulations and compliance reasons to do this as well. You all get into sampling like this, again, later in your program in environmental science, when you get into wetland delineation, uh, these sort of sampling designs become pretty important. So there's lots of different methods we can use for fixed area plots. 
We can measure, you know, these bullseye sort of designs where, you know, you don't want to measure a, a lot of trees because that takes you a lot of time, which costs more money. So small trees, you can fit more of them per acre, right? So use really small plots to estimate your really small trees, and then use bigger and bigger plots to estimate bigger and bigger trees, okay? So you can nest little plots and then bigger plots around them, but in the little plots, all you're looking for is the little trees, and in the bigger plots, you're looking for those bigger trees. So this is gonna be a very common sampling design because it balances good information with efficiency. And so once you've got that, we've already talked about the expansion factor, how you take the data you collect and convert it into the data you need. So the expansion factor for a 10th acre plot is 10. So if you have a 10th acre plot, you need 10 of them to figure out how many trees you have per acre. So you multiply each tree in your plot by 10. That's how many trees per acre it represents. And then we already talked about basal area, how you would need to know the basal area of each of those. You add them all up and you multiply it by the inverse of your plot size. So that's fixed area plots, very easy to understand. Here's something you probably never heard of, and it's kind of a weird way we can estimate forests. But what we can do is we can use an angle gauge. And that angle gauge can be anything. So I can use my thumb at the length of my arm here as an angle gauge, because as long as my thumb doesn't change size and it's always the same distance from my eye, there is an angle there that that is defined. And so what I can do is I can take my angle gauge, I can stand in a spot out in the woods, and I can spin in a circle. And I'm just looking at each tree, and I'm trying to tell if the trees look wider than my thumb or narrower than my thumb. And if they're wider than my thumb, it means they're close enough to me that that tree um, should be tallied. And if they're narrower than my thumb, that means they're narrower than this set angle I've got which means that tree is not going to be tallied, okay? And so the math behind this is a little complicated, but it's really cool. It's just based on, you know, if I have a 10 inch tree and I stand at the exact distance where it looks the exact same width as my thumb, then there's a relationship between similar triangles. The triangle defined by my eye to this side of my thumb, to that side of my thumb, and back to my eye is going to have the same angle as the triangle to define by my eye to that 10 inch diameter tree to the other side of it and back to my eye. And so if I do that, what I can figure out then is how much basal area does that tree represent if it were in a plot? And I was estimating the basal area. So again, the math's more complicated, but what that gets you to is this idea, bigger trees have bigger plots. They have to be further away from me for my thumb to look wider than Smaller trees have smaller plots, okay? And so what you're doing when I'm standing in this spot right here trying to eyeball all these trees, I'm going in a circle and I'm able to say, that tree is wider than my thumb. I'm in its plot. This tree is wider than my thumb, I'm in its plot. This tree out here is narrower than my thumb. I'm not standing in its plot. In the plot, out of the plot, in the plot, out of the plot, out of the plot, out of the plot. And so, my thumb is going to have some arbitrary multiplier. My thumb may represent 7.4 square feet of basal area for each tree that's in my plot. But we have little wedges of glass we call prisms, and now they're made out of plastic too that diffracts the light. It's the same concept. It diffracts it by a set angle. And so if it moves that image of the tree all the way out from where the tree is above and below the glass, then I know that that tree is going to be in I'm gonna be in that tree's plot, but that little wedge of glass, it'll be set up so each tree that's in counts for 10 square feet per acre of basal area. And so what you can figure out from that, we have other complicated equipment called a reliscope that can do it. But basically the probability of tallying it's a tree now depends on how big it is, okay? And so the smaller the angle, the more trees you're gonna include in the sample, the wider the angle, the less trees you're gonna include. That's what the inside a reliscope looks like. So you can see it takes some training to get the students good at this because it looks kind of complicated. But really, here's that wedge prism where you tally it because it still overlaps. You don't tally it because it's all the way out. And we don't have time to go into borderline trees today, but use that wedge prism. But the cool thing is now, you know, basal area is hard to calculate, right? Because you got to get that spreadsheet out. You got to figure out the cross sectional area of each tree. You got to add them all up. But if I have that 10 BAF little wedge prism in my hand, I just go in a circle and I say, I got seven trees that are in. 
basal area in that point is 70 square feet per acre. So by just using angles and those relationships of similar triangles, I very, very quickly estimate basal area. So that's how the, this point sampling works. You can get prisms and other devices that have different basal area factors. So each tree that's in counts for 5, 10, 20, 40 square feet per acre of basal area. And you can use those in different spots in the country, depending on tree size. But the calculation for basal area is very, very easy. Okay? Using that point sampling to get trees per acre, that's much more complicated. Because now there's different expansion factor for each tree diameter because plot size depends. So that's more complicated. <clears throat> so there's pros and cons for each of these. Sampling in a fixed area plot is dependent on the frequency of occurrence, and point sampling is dependent on tree size. And then the expansion factor is the same for all trees in a fixed area plot, but basal area is hard to calculate. It varies by tree in a point sample, but basal area is easy to calculate. So <clears throat> there's different pros and cons. And of course, you can combine these. <clears throat> You can have a fixed area plot here for small trees, another one here for small trees, and then you can have a point centered right here where you're using point sampling for your base trees. And so you can combine point sampling with plot sampling as the same sort of nested design. So I know that's kind of confusing. Usually uh, what we do is we go out in lab and let y'all try this, uh, but because of COVID, you know, Dr. Jerez has shifted some things around. So not this semester, but uh, I'm always around if you want to Ask more questions on this stuff. <clears throat> you can estimate all this for dead trees. I'm talking about live trees, but you can do dead trees too. And so there's different literature out there where they figure out different decay classes for dead trees and how to categorize them. So lots of options there. Dead trees are important for carbon. They're important for soils. Um, they can be important for fuel loading. They can be important for wildlife. So lots of reasons you may want to sample dead trees. And one thing uh, that you can do to sample dead trees is use transects. And so you can see this, this is an area where there's been a high wind event like Hurricane Laura that just passed through Louisiana. And we have a lot of down dead wood here. Would you wanna go and be in there and try to use the fixed area plot to estimate this? That would be very, very difficult. So instead we can use a transect and there's lots of math that goes into this, but you can get an estimate of volume of down woody debris from putting in a transect and measuring the diameters of different pieces um, that intersect with your transect. So, so transects can be pretty useful. We use transects a lot in wildlife, right? Where they'll do spotlight surveys for deer, where that's up and down a road. So that's essentially a transect using the road as a transect. Um, so transects come into play a lot as well. So any questions on forest biometrics? And again, that's a three credit hour course in 50 minutes. So just a quick overview of everything.